Bibles, would you turn to Ephesians chapter 6 as we look at God's protective armor for us and the attacks of, of Satan. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6. I'll begin reading in verse 10 in, in just a, a couple of moments. You know, the shortest war on record in the history of the world occurred August 27th, 1896. It was known as the Anglo-Zanzibar War. The war lasted all of 45 minutes. Someone quipped, it didn't last long enough for you to say Zanzibar. But this brief war broke out as the result of a broken agreement. Uh, Zanzibar at that time, the late 1800s, came under the protection of England with the understanding that should the throne be vacated, England would be able to select the next ruler of Zanzibar. Opposed to that, though, when the ruler died, Sultan Khalid bin Bargash succeeded the recently deceased uh, king. That upset the English in a great measure because they had their own individual that they wanted to serve. The Brits surrounded the uh, castle there. Uh, 500 individuals of Khalid's army uh, were casualties, and the Brits only lost one. Thus ended a war which began at 9 a.m. It finished before 10 a.m. that day. As I think about that brief war, we're contrasting that today with the longest war in history. It's a spiritual war that was waged first in the heavens. We saw last week that it ensued before the time that mankind first sinned, that it is going on today even as I speak, and it will continue until the Lord himself brings to a culmination this world as we know it. There's no war to which we can compare this spiritual war, it is not observed literally with the physical eye. Now, we see results of that, but many times we look at individuals or we look at nations and we displace the anger toward that war to the physical entity when beneath it is actually a spiritual entity. We looked last week, for instance, in Daniel 10 when the messenger angel was hindered from coming to Daniel because there was a war with Michael, or rather there was a war between Michael, the archangel, and the prince of Persia, that spiritual ruler who imposed his will on a nation. That's why as we look at the atrocities that are happening in the world today, it should not surprise us because the reality of the source of those goes behind what we see into the spiritual realm. It involves entities much more powerful than any earthly regime. And it's engaged not just among nations, but it is actually engaged toward individuals, spiritual conflict, temptations, testings, trials that individuals go through. But the interesting thing about this war is it is both settled and ongoing. The devil and those who follow him know their destiny. They know their doom. It has already been determined, yet the battles ensue even today. And just like the shortest war in history, the battle is over power, over control. The rightful Lord of all versus the one who would interpose the rebellious one, the devil. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Paul is writing about this cosmic conflict and how we're to be equipped to engage in it. He said, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. 
For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith which with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Let's pray. Father, as we look for this second week at the subject of spiritual warfare, Father, we know as sure as we are here today that this cosmic conflict that has ramifications not only on nations but individuals is ongoing but father we thank you that there's victory in christ and lord as those of us who have trusted you you have saved us from the consequences of sin and lord you have enabled us to be saved and protected from the power of sin and the evil consequences that result uh, from this conflict. So Lord, as we look at the defensive weaponry today, just help us, Father, not only to understand it, but to be able to apply each instrument we mention. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you know, this is our second week uh, here in uh, these nine verses that I just read. If you were with us last week, we looked at the offensive weaponry. We talked about prayer. We talked about uh, the sword of the spirit. And so we looked at the positive aspects. But today we're going to look really at the defensive or the protective armor that we as believers have. If you were with us last week, uh, you may note, and it was in our notes, that, that we have four uh, simple words of instruction, or we might call it a fourfold plan in engaging in spiritual warfare. The first is to this, know that we are in a spiritual conflict. It sure helps to not be blindsided, that we understand that there is this cosmic conflict going on and that we are often find ourselves in the midst of that. And so we're to know. The second uh, thing we looked at last week, while we know that we're to be humble. You remember in Jude chapter 1, the only chapter, but verse 9, and we talked about how our ladies are engaged in the study of Jude on, on Monday nights, every other Monday, uh, those who are involved in that. But, but we talked about the fact that even Michael the archangel, the powerful angel, didn't just take on the devil himself, but he said, the, the Lord rebuke you. And so we talked about if, if the great angel understands humbly that he in his own strength did not have power to engage in this conflict, then how much more should we be humble in our approach? Then thirdly, we looked at the truth that we need to know that we have a greater resource, and that resource is the very presence of God, Christian, in your life. We, we looked at 1 John 4.4. 4. Greater is he that is in us than the one that is in the world. But then finally, the fourth and important truth that is often neglected is this. We need to apply the truths that we see. It's one thing to know something. It's another thing to actually take the step and apply it. And so last week and this week, we're given the command to put on the armor of God. We may understand there's a conflict. We may know that we have the resources, but we also must access the resources that we have. So we began, like I said, last week at looking at the offensive weaponry. Today, we're going to look at the defensive uh, weapons or the armor. You know, when I was young, um, I spent a lot of time around my great uncle Jack Marshall. It, he was my grandmother's brother-in-law, actually. My grandmother passed away long before I did. My paternal grandfather I was not very close to. And so really, my uncle Jack was like a surrogate grandfather to me. He's the one that I've shared. If you've been here, he taught me amazingly how a match burned twice. He lit it. 
He said, Rick, you want to see a match burn twice? And I was thinking, man, this is going to be a magic trick. He lit it, he blew it out, and he stuck it on my finger as a five-year-old. I think they would call that child abuse now. <laughs> but he was tough, and he loved me. Don't get it wrong. He, he loved me. Same uncle, I told the blackberry story. I was eating blackberry in the evening and thinking I was in blackberry heaven. He said, boy, we're going to go pick blackberries tomorrow. And I thought, man, all I could think was blackberries and cream. I got out, it was 95 degrees and hot, briar sticking me all over. He taught me a lot of life lessons. My Uncle Jack was a man's man out of necessity. His father died when he was young. He was the only male child, and literally at the age of 15, he had to work to provide for his siblings and for his mom. And so he knew how to work. He had the best garden, not just what I say it, but if you ever traveled 24 into Appomattox for years in the 80s and 90s, 70s, it was that large garden that you would see to the left. Uncle Jack didn't like sports. I mean, he thought ball was a waste of time. I mean, he never, I never knew him, but he loved boxing. And you could get him talking about boxing. And in the 70s and 80s, boxing was really big. You could watch it on regular TV in the afternoons. And this man who didn't care about anything else loved and was intrigued with boxing. So I was thinking about him being enamored with that, and I thought about the life of the boxer or the event of boxing. There's the offensive attack in boxing, but there's also the defensive aspect of it, of protecting. And so I began to think in the beautiful age of, of the internet, you can find out these answers. I thought in a 12 round fight, how many punches are actually thrown? Now, I, I realize, and it makes sense to me, the heavyweights would throw fewer because they've got a lot more to throw and they get more easily fatigued. So the average heavyweight would throw around 360 punches in 36 minutes. Now, lighter guys might throw up to uh, 1,200 uh, in 36 minutes. And, and the, some of those would be like heavy hits, but others would be just jabs and, and things like that. And I began to think about spiritual warfare. Every one of us needs to take a punch, but isn't it a lot better to deflect the punch or have the punch miss you? As we engage in this spiritual conflict, we need to understand that what God has equipped us with, that we might be able to defend ourselves and the attacks from Satan. And some of those things, like with the shield of faith deflecting so that we don't take others being equipped so when the hit comes to us that we're able to endure. I think of Martin Luther, the great reformer. He talked about the temptations of Satan. He says, you can't keep the birds from flying around your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. God has equipped us to be able to stand against the temptations, against the testing that comes upon us. But before we look at the defensive armor, I think we need to revisit verse 11, which to me is the central verse, and we referenced last week, where he says, put on the full armor of God, not just the offensive weaponry, but the defensive armor, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. That word put on is a command, and it's in what might be called the aorist tense of the Greek language. And, and the interesting thing about the verb in the commands in, in, in the Greek language, it has not only to do with time, like in English we have past, present, future, but actually the tense of the verb has to do with the kind of action. And so the, the idea here put on in the aorist tense actually points to a state of urgency, that it's not just something that we might have suggested that we would choose to do, like that which would be on a buffet line, that we could take or leave it. No, it is pertinent that we put on the armor of God. Why is that? So that we can stand against the schemes of the devil, deflecting the temptations, deflecting the lies, able to endure the things that come against us. If you've been a believer long enough, you can attest to your familiarity with the schemes that Satan has against you. He knows what 
can get us. He knows what can draw us away. He knows what, uh, for lack of a better word, might be able to wilt us. And if we stand on our own, if we stand on our own strength, our own wisdom, our own resolve, we will not make it. That's why verse 10 says, be strengthened what? In the Lord and by his vast strength. So with that in mind, let's look at four defensive parts of armor of which the believer is to be clothed. First, we're to put on the belt of truth. That's sort of the part that's really not seen. Uh, In that day, when men um, traveled off and they would travel with long robes, they didn't have jeans like you may have on today. But in that day, whenever a a man would engage in some type of physical activity, in this case, uh, in warfare, he would pull up that robe, take the sash, take the belt, wrap that, freeing that garment so that it might not hinder what he is doing. The belt kept everything in place. So as we look at all of the armor here, the belt was considered that which kept everything else uniform. Now, as we look at the four um, uh, pieces of defensive armor today, I want to look at Daniel's three friends in regard to each of these, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You may remember in Daniel 3, uh, the king built a great statue, wanted everyone to bow down to it, but because of their righteousness, because of their faith, because of their salvation in God and their understanding that God alone was Lord, they would not bow down. And you know what happened. They were thrown into the fiery furnace. And and so as we look at them, I want to consider these pieces of armor in in light of that. And, And these three friends of Daniel, they were attacked because of their faithfulness to God. And the scripture tells us that like those three men in the Old Testament, if you and I make a stand for Jesus Christ, we can be certain that we will come under attack. I've seen some men and some women, maybe that attack has come directly on them physically. Maybe it's come toward a child. Maybe it's come through a work situation. And and there's this thought, well, because I'm a Christian, I'm going to be protected from everything. God, many times, as we'll see with Daniel's three friends, will protect us through things, but that doesn't mean that we're immune from being attacked in the Bible, in the battle, rather. In fact, it often happens. Jesus said, again, that we would face it. And so we see here that when they were put to the test, Daniel's three friends, they clung first to the truth, the belt of truth. Now, Adam and Eve did not do that. Because when the serpent came to them, we looked at it last week, they began to question the truth that God had their well-being and concern. They began to question the truth of God's word, but not Daniel's friends. Being threatened with death in a fiery furnace, they said, if the God we serve exists, and he does, then he can rescue us. And so when they were faced with the threat to try to shrink back and deny the Lord, they said the truth is God is sovereign over all, and God did to deliver them. Listen, when Satan comes at you personally, You need to learn to speak truth back to him. Speak it back. If he challenges your sense of worth, then you need to say, I'm precious in the sight of God. If he tempts you to do wrong, stand on the truth that while sin might bring a temporary pleasure, it brings terrible eternal consequences. The scripture says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Those three friends, before they went into that furnace, were already wrapped in the belt of truth. But I want you to look at the second thing we're to put on, the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate speaks of a a very heavy piece of armor, and it actually would go from about the kneecap up to the neck. And it would cover not just the front, but it would cover the back of an individual. It would be almost like a thick gown like you would put over that would be 
heavier than a gown. It would actually provide protection. And the breastplate protected the vital organs. It protected the vital organs. Now, Paul makes it clear what this righteousness is in Philippians 3, and it's this. It is not by our works according to the law, but it is through faith in Jesus Christ. We need to put on God's righteousness. It's an imputed righteousness. It's not our own self-righteousness because uh, we will find out very quickly if we try to engage in this battle in our own righteousness, it's not enough. But we put on the righteousness of God. In fact, 1 Corinthians 1.30 says this, Jesus is our righteousness. And so it's as if Jesus himself, he is our righteousness. He stands with us in this. But we're called to apply that righteousness. And Daniel, whose three friends existed before the incarnation of Jesus Christ, nonetheless did that. They were attacked for righteous living and they were delivered through their righteous living. They were protected in it. Daniel 3 tells us that the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, took occasion to accuse the three before the king, not for their unrighteousness, but for their righteousness. Is that true in your life? Can people not find accusation except through your righteousness in the Lord. In days marked by ever-increasing unrighteousness, we're called to put on the breastplate of righteousness. But then third, we're to take on the shield of faith. Verse 16, Paul says, in every situation, take up the shield of faith. Some translations say, above all, do this. Now, that doesn't mean that it's more important, but it means that it is to be used in all situations. Going back to that boxing illustration, it's a lot better to have a punch miss you than it is to be able to take the punch. And so the shield actually deflects it. It speaks of the fiery darts. And the fiery darts, what the intent would be that it would come upon the person, burn the clothing, and, and cause great harm. But that shield, often that would have at least part of it would, it would, it would take on that, it would protect it, and that fire would fizzle out and not bring harm to the warrior. Of, of all of the armor, the shield of faith is the one that's mobile. It can move. You know, the others, it only moves as you move. And so it can be positioned moment by moment, move to the area of attack. Poor Adam and Eve, they did not use the shield of faith. They doubted God's goodness when it was suggested by the serpent. They doubted God's truthfulness. But the three friends of Daniel used it. Boy, what a beautiful thing. They replied to the king's threat, our God can deliver us if he so desires, but even if he does not, we will not deny him. Now think about that for a moment. That's powerful. Their faith was not in an event or an outcome, but in the reality of the person of God. I can't emphasize that enough. They said, our God can deliver us, but I want you to know, even if in his sovereignty he chooses not to do it, we will not deny him. He is still true. And, and so many of us, we put out that fleece and we say, God, if you do that, I'll believe. God, if you don't do that, I'll believe. But the three friends, they did not have their faith in an event or an outcome, but the person of God. What about young David? He had the same faith. I, I thought how funny it was when he fought Goliath and here's this big giant over nine feet tall and he's got his shield, 160 pounds and uh, a nine foot tall man full of fear. And Daniel, they try to give him uh, defensive arm and he says, I, I can't use these. And so he goes out a young boy was he standing in armor? Some people would say no. He was standing in armor. He was not standing in physical armor. He was standing in spiritual armor in the truth of who God is. How do we develop such faith? 
How can we maneuver the shield of faith? It comes through knowing God personally, through, through becoming a person of prayer, a person who takes seriously the word of God, someone who loves, who prays, who serves. I wonder, are you making God a priority in your life, knowing him, prayer, study of the word? David and Daniel's three friends, they had faith because they knew the one in whom they believed. But then the fourth thing, we're to put on the helmet of salvation. The helmet protects the head against attack. It protects the central place of information and instruction. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says this, Christian, and unbeliever for that measure. We take every thought captive to obey Christ. So that dark comes. And the helmet of salvation protects. We take it captive. We don't allow it to take us captive. We take it captive. Daniel's three friends experienced personally the Lord's salvation. And then we see what is called a theophany. The king who realized how righteous they were, he grieved all night. He came back the next day and what happened? They saw a fourth one. Like the son of the gods, a picture of God himself with them. He was their salvation through the fire. He was there with them. The helmet of salvation. We are saved from something. Think about that. Whenever you mention saved, you're saved from something. If I'm saved from a fire, I'm saved from that in its effect. If I'm saved from a storm, I brought out of that. If I'm saved from someone who's in har a harmful influence to me, I'm saved and removed from that. And when the believer is saved, he or she is saved from sin, from the consequences of sin. And God's desire through sanctification is that we be saved from the power of sin. Not only that we would be saved from the penalty, but through a joint work with Jesus, saved from the power of sin. We must claim it. I wonder today, are you putting on the helmet of salvation? And I might add that we also have a future glorification that awaits us where we'll be saved even from the presence of sin. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says, But since we belong to the day, let us as the child's children just sang earlier, be self-controlled, self-controlled, and put on the armor of faith and love and what? The helmet of the hope of salvation. Those are the four pieces of armor that God gives us through Paul. But as we close this short series on the subject of spiritual warfare, I hope that you'll remember the practical four steps that we mentioned last week at the beginning. Know that you're in a spiritual warfare. Know it. Don't think it may be. Understand it. So when you see it and you see the physical results of it, you can actually go to the source. Remember last week, my frustration at how they make pro teams change their names, but the name devil is never changed because everybody thinks it's just a fictitious character. He's not. Know that we're in a spiritual war. Secondly, be humble. Be humble. Realizing that if Michael the archangel would not even take on the devil himself, who are, to we, who are we to think? But as verse 10 tells us in our text, we're to be strengthened with the strength of the Lord. Realize our dependence upon, upon God. And third, know our great resource. Remember Simon, when he realized the power of God was more, he said, hey, I'm giving up what I'm doing. I want what God's got going on. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But then fourth, apply it. It's one thing to know the weapons, to know the defensive armor. It's another to actually apply it. Why is that? This war is not a 45-minute skirmish over a tiny part of the earth. It is a cosmic conflict that is long and spiritual in nature, yet God has given us all we need to engage. Let's pray. Father, we look to your word today. We thank you that you did not leave us uninformed.
But through the pen of Paul, through his words, we understand that through prayer, through applying the armor, by standing in your truth, that, Lord, you give us all that we need in order to live powerful, triumphant lives and to stand in the midst of the conflict. Father, there may be some today who have never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are, are not able to access the resources that we just mentioned because they have not been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. They've not experienced the salvation that comes only through Christ. They're not living in the one who is true. And their faith is not in the one that Daniel's three friends believed in. But I know today, Lord, that can change. So if there be any who need to believe, I pray your spirit would convict this hour. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.